to an outsider, we're pretty awesome. It's that inside our bodies and our minds, a lot of times, we are the ones who are giving ourselves pushback or even pushing ourselves down. I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. Our guest today is Tanya Katan, and let me tell you, she is just a ball of creativity and energy. You will hear it in her voice. Her zest for life is infectious. And one of the things that I really think you'll enjoy about Tanya is that she just, she's creative to the core. Anything you're talking about, anything you're looking at or considering, she has ideas and thoughts and literal questions you can ask yourself to help spark more creativity, to help inject more open-mindedness and um, her stories. I mean, you talk about someone who leveraged adversity. She uh, she wasn't asked to leave, but she was asked not to come back at a uh, certain job. And it was a bit of a surprise, and that's when she was faced with starting her own thing. I was introduced to Tanya via her campaign called It Was Never a Dress. You might have seen it out in the world. It did go, I'm using air quotes, but they're real, viral. Um, and I think 20 million impressions were garnered over the course of 24 hours. And she was the co-creator of this campaign. Brilliant, brilliant creative campaign. And we talk through how she comes up with these ideas and what she does when she has a lack of ideas and creativity. Tanya is also a public speaker. So she gives a couple of tips on that front. And we just kind of explore everything in this conversation. Speaking of going out on your own, maybe you are considering it. You have a comfy corporate job. You're thinking about taking the leap and doing your own thing. Maybe you already have, and you are looking to take it up a notch or 10. If that's the case, and you want to focus on your presence online, your personal brand, and just your story, owning your story, that essence, in order to do so, check out renegadebrandbootcamp.com. So this is a program I started last year. We are on our third program now, and it's incredible. The mosaic of women that we're curating and creating together to help one another, equal parts education, collaboration, and accountability is amazing. And so uh, renegadebrandbootcamp.com, if you're looking for that thing to just up-level yourself. Over the last decade as an entrepreneur, I've learned that the lines between work and life are often blurred. Rather than fighting it, I embrace this new way of working and the flexibility it has given me. It has enhanced my quality of life. Now, Staples is encouraging us to do the same with the launch of their Staples Work Life magazine. Let me tell you, I dig this magazine. It's my new bathtub and airplane reading material. The quarterly Staples Work-Life magazine features original content from entrepreneurs who offer tips on things like creative problem solving, strengthening your leadership skills, overcoming workplace obstacles, and working smarter, not harder. To subscribe today, head to staplesworklifemag.com. 
Tanya, welcome to the Why Not Now show in the spirit of Why Not Now. Let's hop in. Can you tell me about a time when you had a big decision to make and you asked yourself, why not now? Well, Amy Jo, I've been thinking (laughs) about this question for a little while as um, an excited listener of your podcast. And why not now sounds like a casual question one might ask if you're, you know, you're on like work break and you're walking in a park and you see a tree and you sit underneath it and then you see a squirrel and you think that squirrel looks free. I'd like to be free too. Maybe when I go back to work, I will tell them, uh, you know, I'm going to quit my job and be free. And (laughs) why not now? Sounds like a casual casual question that you ask the universe and then the universe says, you know what, Tanya, this is a great time. And so uh, in the spirit of why not now and sharing something that I've never shared before and that I don't write about and I didn't even write about in my new book, which is about taking risks in the workplace, I will share what um, my why not now moment was um, in relation to me feeling free at work. So I was working in a job like a lot of humans do. And uh, I wasn't fired from said job, but I wasn't invited to come back to work on Monday. And this was at a time where I literally, my partner and I had saved all of our pennies and sold our house in order to buy a larger house that we could just barely afford. And we bought this house and everything was great. And I was working for a company and public speaking and selling software and things were going well. And we were a little stretched financially, but what the hell. And so I went to work after one of my walking around uh, a park breaks. And um, I was sort of told that I didn't need to come back the following week. And, you know, there have been moments in my life when that why not now question was really casual, like, "Mm, this seems like a good time to leave a job or to start a new career or to take a risk. But this was a moment where I wasn't anticipating being out of work with a new home and stretched financially. And so while I was in midair questioning why not now, which really was like, what the is that? What the hell? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, which if you play it at half speed, sounds like why not now? But it was, really, it was just a string of expletives. And, uh, you know, I, I thought, what the hell am I going to do, uh, honestly? And so what I did was I landed in my desk chair and got to work with creating uh, my own company, which is public speaking, consulting and coaching. Uh, uh, so the the moment, you know, that was an unexpected one. And I mean, there have been many times throughout my life and career when that moment has been more constructed, uh, more mm-hmm. on my terms, or I sort of, you know, shaped the narrative and then followed through and things were great. But I didn't have another job lined up. I didn't have, I didn't anticipate uh, that moment. And therefore, I had to figure it out really quickly. Wow. Well, first of all, Thank you for sharing something you haven't talked about before. And literally, why not now? Talking about this, why not now? That's really meta, actually. I can't imagine. So you basically kind of got this, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here type of thing. You weren't expecting it. And, oh, I can only imagine kind of that feeling of, well, it sounds like it might have felt half panic, half free with a little extra splash of panic, probably because of the investment of the home and and worrying about lifestyle and stuff. But it's really interesting to look at how you've leveraged that adversity because I think you might have emailed me around this time. And I was reading between the lines as though, even though you didn't map it out, this is the best thing. That's like, I, I didn't even know if you left or whatever happened. It didn't matter because it was just like, oh yeah, universe has been wanting her to do this for a while. Like nudge, nudge, nudge. Then finally, fine, I'll push you out the door. <laughs> so let's break this down. You get the news and you said you landed in your chair at your desk at home. Was that literally you went from the office to the chair? Or what happened in the interim? No. So the interim literally went like this. I got on the got. I emailed you and a handful of people whom I admire, respect, and feel uh, like a, a kindness between who are in positions in the world that I think are really cool. And I'm like, 
hey, can we have a conversation? And uh, while I was sort of setting up these conversations, uh, I was also writing in my journal and working with a career coach. So it was sort of good timing. And it was like, well, what do I want to focus on? Uh, what do I want to do? And it's like, oh, what I've been doing within this job, which is public speaking, uh, which is creative consulting and all this. But I, I want to do it for myself. This way I have, you know, a larger reach or an opportunity to connect with many different industries and people in the world and learn about who and how they do and find ways to speak and inspire who and how they do every day. So yes, you're totally right. You know, for context, um, I was working in a company and as you know, we created this, this viral campaign mm -hmm. that was all about women empowerment. It was called It Was Never a Dress. And I bring it up because, you know, there was a moment where I'm, I'm speaking about this campaign, It Was Never Addressed, which is sort of reimagining uh, the women's bathroom vector. Uh, instead of her wearing a dress, you know, sort of seeing that we were looking at her back and in front she was wearing a cape. And Brilliant, I by the yes. way. I mean, we're going to talk more about this in, in a little bit. We have to, but I don't want to just skim over it. But this is, oh, anyway, this was well, huge. Oh, you're sweet. And well, and I think the point is, is that, you know, ultimately my job for this company was selling software, right? And that's legit. That's what, the, obviously they couldn't hire me if they couldn't sell their product. And then I realized at a certain point in, in speaking more and more about this campaign and in front of, you know, d tech companies and also conferences and fields of all stripes, that people were inspired more about the message of using creativity to transcend or get unstuck. And at that, it's several points throughout my job, I thought, hmm, selling software is okay, but I want to sell capes. That would be awesome, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so I had that inkling throughout for sure. And yes, I think it was, you know, the universe saying, hey, Tanya, if you're not going to leave on your own, we're just going to push you out of the nest. And, um, it, you know, so again, uh, even though it was an unexpected moment, I had been gathering information about um, what my value was to myself and what my value was in the workforce and to, to people uh, around the globe. And so that's kind of, so I started exploring, well, how do I make public speaking a business, a full-time job? How do I beef up my consulting that I wasn't able to do when I was working for this company? And I put together a website in literally four days I gave myself because I needed to pay the rent slash mortgage and built a website, came up with offerings, wrote it all out and sent an email out to my list as I continued to consult with my friends and colleagues uh, like yourself who offered me advice and insights about moving forward in the world. And it worked. People started hiring me, you know, and I realized that instead of the big scary proposition of not getting any gigs because I wasn't associated with a company that in fact I got more speaking opportunities because I wasn't associated with a company or just selling a specific thing that I was open now to sell capes or creativity as I like to call it so mm -hmm. that was really that 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 you know my my thought and feeling of fear um, was quelled by more opportunities than I ever imagined Oh, yeah. It's like the wings appeared. But it, it's such a time where it felt, you know, probably so unexpected, but also inconvenient. And we talk a lot about so many people that come on this show have a common theme in that they are really good at leveraging adversity and not the, um, oh, let's make lemonade out of lemons. That's cute type of positive attitude. It's more of, an, oh, no this is going to be like a slingshot forward. <laughs> so like, it, it just is interesting to see how so many cases, it's a similar situation where something unexpected or maybe unwelcome at the time has happened. And then that's exactly what was used for leveraging that really an asset that was disguised as adversity. So I hope that as people are listening, they can kind of put themselves either, maybe they're in a current situation that's similar or they have this dream of getting pushed out of the nest slash maybe flying on their own. And I just hope they can realize and trust that that experience and leaving in in taking on that big challenge and and or risk as we look at it is it's amazing how that serves us moving forward right because now that you've done this do you find your appetite 
for risk is higher and that you're like, oh, well, that actually seemed like the scariest thing ever. And now it's not that big of a deal, but thank goodness I did that first, you know, step. Yeah. I think, you know, actually I had a higher tolerance for risk prior to buying a fancy house. Not going to lie. Not gonna oh. lie. <laughs> you know, I mean, on, you know, honestly, I, you know, I had been prone to, to leaping into new, you know, careers, situations without knowing anything for a long time. And I think that what happened in this moment is, you know, and this is something, I hear a lot from entrepreneurs that I I work with, you know, it's like at some point we kind of get comfortable and that feels real good because we can pay our bills and, oh, we have health insurance. Oh, look at us. I have a house. And then what happens is we stop being hungry. And for me, it was a reminder of what's so exciting about taking the leap. It's that I'm hungry. It's that, you know, and the hunger can exist. It can exist, you know, for financial reasons. But for me, it's always existed uh, for curiosity for learning, for doing more or stretching myself in ways I didn't even know I was capable of. So that mo- that was a moment I felt complacent and comfortable. And the universe said, you don't like to function like this. You like to push things and make yourself uncomfortable. So mm-hmm. there. So it was a great reminder for sure. And so my appetite for risk taking now is, you know, it's, it's all over the place, you know. And I think, uh, as you said, I mean, to me, anything worth doing really resides on the corner of like, terrified and excited at the same time. And so that's my litmus for taking risks. You know, if I if I feel some connection, some sort of emotional, energetic connection to the thing, and um, it scares me, and it also excites me, I jump. Mm, what a good formula. And I know within your book, Creative Trespassing, you talk about bringing creativity into the workplace, but you also talk about self-limits being opportunities, right? And so, I mean, as I listen to your your theory and your case studies, really workplace could be replaced with any situation in life, really, um, it seems. Uh, but I watched your Google Talks talk, and um, you, you've been public speaking for so long. A lot of people who listen to the podcast are entrepreneurs or they are budding entrepreneurs. And I hear a lot that people, they want to do more public speaking. And so let's talk about this world for a moment, a world that both you and I have been involved in for quite some time. And you are so much yourself. (laughs) I don't even know if that makes sense, but you are so you when you are in front of a group and it just, it appears and feels as someone in the audience. I've been in the audience multiple times when you've spoke. It just appears that you are most comfortable there. Has it always been that way? Uh, Yes and no. First, I should say that I come from theater training. I have a degree in theater. And uh, that trains you on a basic level to see the audience, understand who you're performing to, and connect with them and offer them something specifically. So every talk I give, I consider the audience that I'm speaking in front of. I tailor my talk specifically for them and offer them something that they could use that might inspire them beyond that moment in time. So my comfort level, though, comes from practicing, or as the theater kids like to call it, rehearsal. And it's the act of doing it over and over and over again. And so I just gave a talk where you gave a a lovely talk uh, at the World Domination Summit a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Fun crowd. (laughs) Oh, my God. Fun crowd. And as a result, I mean, beforehand, I'm like, this is a very sophisticated, creative, fun, smart crowd. I really need to show up for them or they're going to boot me off the stage. And (laughs) and so I was super nervous, uh, to be honest with you. And again, as long as... Guess I'm showing up with the best stories and the most uh, relevant and resonant information for that group. I'm going to be okay, even if I'm freaking out silently. And one trick that I learned early on, this might be good for uh, all your listeners who are aspiring public speakers, is this idea of, of giving a gift. I think I write about it in Creative Trespassing. I write a little bit about public speaking tips. But, uh, the, you know, when you give a gift, Amy Jo, nobody's going to be like, Amy Jo, I don't want a gift. Gifts suck. You keep your wrapped beautiful thing, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, True. You know, 
it's it's an offering, right? And um, and in that, so I, I think about and and coach people with public speaking to think about what they're doing as an offering or a gift. Assuming they prepared, considered their audience, and they're showing up with the best they got, they are giving a gift. The audience will never say your gift sucks, okay? And the minute you you turn it into I'm offering you something, even if you're the vessel delivering the talk, it's not about you anymore. It becomes about the audience. And I know this sounds counterintuitive because your body's up there telling your stories from childhood or whatever. And yet, the minute you change your mindset into I'm offering a gift, it becomes about them. Then you're listening to the audience. You're like, that joke didn't work for them. That's okay. I've got a few more in my back pocket. I'm going to offer them up. Or I'm going to ask them questions because they really need to talk. You know, But that's the, the mindset that I sort of uh, ascribe to and that I teach people about is offering a gift. I love it. It's so cool, too. To um, I often just think of myself as the vehicle. Right. I'm just delivering something. I happen to be, you know, in this in this phase in between the audience and the gift. But it's it's nice to remove ourselves from the spotlight a little bit and realize that we're being of service and it's our responsibility, not a hey, look at me. Um it's it just changes the game for me in terms of of switching around like that. I love the gift analogy. I will always remember that. And I'm excited to go back and watch your World Domination Summit talk when it's out and I hope everybody else does too because I'm sure you nailed it. It's it's always fun to watch you perform. You truly are a performer. I would not call you a speaker. So and for your listeners, Amy Joe is not my agent or my sister. She's just <laughs> <laughs> I, that is true however i could be i might want to be i'm all about reinventing myself um who knows what's next so let's talk about the one lesson you keep learning over and over oh gosh hmm I, okay, so this goes back <laughs> to, uh, you know, I'm just like, I'm like just responding to whatever comes to mind. Good. I think, I think I'm going I'm to connect back up with the idea of limiting beliefs, you know, that, that you were sort of talking about that we, we kind of stop ourselves from taking these leaps and doing these amazing things. And my limiting belief is I don't belong here. So, um, and that's deep, right? And it's, I don't belong here because I have a degree in theater and I'm standing in front of uh, the entire staff at Expedia explaining to them how to be innovative, right? You know, I don't belong here because I'm speaking in front of chief information officers and I'm not wearing a suit or whatever. And 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 I grew up as an outsider, you know, we, we were a really poor family. I had a single mommy uh, who raised us and um, basically bartered for everything that we were able to have, whether that be like an apartment to live in, uh, to go to summer camp because we couldn't afford it. She bartered her art making skills and um, her cooking skills at the camp so we could go. So I've always felt like an outsider. And um, I think the lesson that I, that I, that I've made a vocation out of is, is reclaiming that I do belong here. Here. And the reasons why I belong here are the reasons why I don't feel like I belong. Uh, that in fact, you know, the, the reasons why the, my, like my flaws or my, my scars or all my awkwardness, they, they aren't in fact detriments, but those are my superpowers. Mm. So that, yeah, I think that's, that's my lesson is that I do belong here. Oh, so good. And it's right in line with your cape brand and your cape in general. You mentioned something a few minutes ago. You said um, after you were, I don't want to say dismissed, but I don't—I guess I don't know what to call it. When they said you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Um, you said you went and started to discover and gather info about the value you had to offer to yourself and to others. How did you do that? What did you do? Please paint the picture for us. 
Yeah, well, good news is, is that uh, since I was little, I, I've been a writer. I've written in journals. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, since I was like six years old, I have crazy amounts of like cloth, flat floral covered in <laughs> journals um, in boxes. And so that's always my writing is my foundation. It's the place in which I can explore. I can write stories, ideas, and I can also write, frankly, about uh, my inner emotional landscape. So so, you know, that that's where I went. I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent. Oh, my gosh, Amy Jo, my, I went, my brain, my brain fires at a very high speed. <laughs> that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lots of things come to them, to my brain, and then it takes me off tangentially, and then I'm like, what was the question again? That's okay. Um, no, I was just, I was excited to hear about the journaling yeah. and the writing. Um, it was just about your fact, your, your mission of discovering and, and gathering info about what value you yeah. offer yourself, but to others as well. Got it. So there, there are two things that are happening is, uh, you know, writing my journal. I'm also going to therapy. Let me just, listeners, listen up. If you have <laughs> health insurance, therapy is a copay for magic. I make no percentage off the sale, the copay of your therapist. Um, it really, you know, to have a, a professional who's trained and licensed to help you <laughs> sort out who you are, how you are, and what your value is, is invaluable. So I was going to therapy. And then, quite frankly, writing an entire website in four days will really kick your ass and get yourself out of the way to explore what is my value for real? What am I going to offer people and charge them money for that I'm actually going to deliver? Deliver on and feel good about. And so having a really tight turnaround, having a deadline for me has always been sheer magic to get out of my own way and discover. So those three things, journaling, therapy, and having to write an entire website from scratch with new offerings that I didn't even know I was offering yet, uh, helped me understand my value very quickly. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. We tackle the most taboo topics on the Why Not Now show. Oftentimes, you're hearing guests share things they've never shared before. In the spirit of things we don't typically talk about, you should know that the Why Not Now show is supported by Poopery, the original before-you-go toilet spray. It's magic. My friends at Poopery have literally taken the smell out of you-know-what. This pure blend of essential oils stops bathroom odor before it begins. Visit Poopery.com and Why Not Now listeners get 20% off with code Why Not Now. That's all one word. And you can hear the story about Poopery in our interview with founder Susie Batiste. That's Why Not Now, episode 28. Poopery is also available at Bed Bath & Beyond. What a good step-by-step, -step, one, two, three. And I love therapy is a copay for magic. Oh my gosh, it's true. It is so true. I love yeah, it. it's astounding. I mean, in our, our society, especially in like Western Civ, it seems that we're very proud to, you know, high five and talk to each other about like, oh, I partied so hard. I vomited and everybody's like, shut up. That's so awesome. What did you do <laughs> last weekend? And it's like, I went to therapy and it's like, wah, wah. It's like, are you kidding me? Um, that We should all be high fiving each other for getting mental health. Agreed. Agreed. It's It's so true. And it's I mean, gosh, I, I little side note here, but when Lincoln was in the NICU, I feel like I've, I have a, a little um, basket of people that help me, right? Like, it's like, oh, we've got this person is a mentor and this person is a da da da. I called my intuitive. And I swear, you have someone that can kind of mirror your soul a bit and, you're going to get down into it and what <laughs> what your soul is trying to tell you. So, I mean, there's so many forms of therapy too. Anyway, <clears throat> so this is just basically a podcast about advertising for therapy. What you're saying about realizing the reason you belong is basically – because you thought you didn't belong. Like the two are, are hand in hand. It's kind of like, okay, you're in the right place because you didn't think you were. It just, it sparked something that as I'm listening to you and I've always just felt such a connection and, and you're so real. With social media, there are plenty of good positive benefits about social, obviously. And then there are some negatives, but it's not really the technology or tools. It's the humans that are using it. So one thing that it just occurred to me and listening to you is that our tolerance for 
people faking it. And our radar and our detectors has become really strong. And our tolerance has become very small, right? So it's like, I think there's something to be said for, wow, you just have to show up as you. Like that is the work. That is, and back to therapy, right? That is the the hardest part, but it's also the easiest. And I think you just do that so well, Tanya, that whatever your clients and the people that you connect with are going to gain, that's going to come through regardless because that's just who you are. So I just want to hat tip you. I mean, it's it's true because a lot of times I think we have to unlayer things and uncondition ourselves and and you just you just are you and I really appreciate that. Well, first of all, I think you're projecting. Um, second, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, um, Amy, do I really thank no, you? No, it's true. I, I truly mean it. I don't know why it just clicked, but I was like, wow, that's one of the. Re- it's people like you. Why we have such a low tolerance for faking it and people being inauthentic is because well, we can see the other. You know, it's true. Yeah, well, thank you. And also, you know, it's interesting because I think, and you know this too, that as people who don't fake it, who are just ourselves, like flaws and and scars and all, you know, what um, what we realize is is that it's way easier. It takes less energy (laughs) so that we can use all that, all of our great energy to actually focus on why we're on the earth. You know what I'm saying? Like when you're faking it, you're like tap dancing in, in a rainstorm and people are throwing shit at you, you know? And when you're just being yourself it's like whoo this feels so good you know it's it's you're in the flow I mean that's why they call it the flow because there's there's sort of an ease about it um so I totally I agree with you that that being yourself is way better and much easier than being someone else plus I'm cuter than someone else (laughs) exactly and I think to also just kind of disclaimer that it's not that you know I think people wake up in the morning and say, hey, I'm going to fake it today. Because I've even had phases where I feel much more authentic than others. And hopefully it's progressively up and to the right and getting better and better. That's my goal. But I think it's refreshing for everyone to just have have that mirror, have people that they can see that are just operating in their zone of genius, unapologetic, but also just true to themselves. I guess what I'm trying to say here is I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad by saying, oh, we've got these posers out there. Um, however, I think we can all audit ourselves a bit every once in a while and check in and be like, okay, am I really, you know – taking the least amount of energy possible to show up as me because if it's taking a lot of energy, I'm probably needing a bit of an adjustment. So we might have gotten a little off topic here, but... I don't judge. This is a safe place. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. you, know what, uh, you know what, Amy Jo, you're re- I, now you're, my brain is just like on overload because you're triggering so many like ideas and stories and, and things like that. But I remember uh, <laughs> being invited to give this talk uh, at Cisco Live, have you have you spoken there? Mm, um, not at live. I'm thinking. Of, I just thought of Citrix. Yes, I, I have, but it was an online thing. So no, oh. maybe it wasn't live. It was live <laughs> online, <laughs> on the line. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Tell me about Cisco Live. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't live at all. We were there was a dead friend person Wendy. Oh. <laughs> um, no, I asked because I the, I'm triggered. I remember this moment. So I was I was at Cisco Live. And Cisco Live, for those who are listening who don't know, it's just like the like a huge conference, you know, with like jumbotrons everywhere. And they invite really fancy, smart, famous people to speak. And then there's me, okay? And I can only be myself, right? And I am going to to speak. Do you know Carrie Lorenz? She was like the first female Tomcat fighter pilot in the U.S. Navy, mm-hmm. period. Yeah. And so I was like, holy shit, I'm going to get up there with my little nerd and like push up my glasses and I was I was speaking about about embracing your superpowers and I'm like who the hell am I I'm like I'm like nerdy nerdy nerd so I get up there and I talk and I you, you ever speak and you're like I'm prepared and I'm there and I know what I'm gonna say but then you have like an out-of-body experience where you're like 
they are booing me. I suck. Oh my gosh. And then all of a sudden it, your time is done. You're done speaking. And I got off that stage and I'm like, holy shit, I'm pretty sure like I farted and tried <laughs> to like, you know, or did so, or said like the F bomb or did something gross and weird and people were booing me and they hated it. And I get off the stage feeling like a profoundly myself. And um, there's Carrie Lorenz, this like Navy pilot lady. And she says to me, how am I going to follow that? That was so great. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I seriously was like, are, are you are you serious? And um, and as a result of that story and of, of sort of being myself and this, you know, eternal journey that I have to, to feel like I belong, I came up with an exercise in my book about about this moment, about, you know, how sometimes we're so caught up in like the bullshit of like, how do I look on social media? How do I look in my clothes? How do I look outside of my home uh, that we forget that to an outsider, we're pretty awesome. It's that inside of our bodies and our minds a lot of times, we are the ones who are giving ourselves pushback or even pushing ourselves down. And so this exercise I came up with in Creative Trespassing is called the I Rock Files, like the Rockford Files, only I Rock. And it asks people to sort of hunt and gather information from outside of yourself of people who are telling you and have been screaming at you that you are awesome, that you are worthy, that you belong here, and keep a file of all of that. So when you start to panic and think you don't don't belong, go to your file and open it up and find a card from one of your customers that says, I really enjoyed, you know, meeting you over lunch. I will totally buy your product or whatever the thing is and, and reassure yourself. So I, I just thought that was a really nice moment of reinforcing who I was in the world when I was like, really? Oh, I love it. The I rock file. I love that. And isn't that, I bet you were just like, what? Did I, was I in the same room as you? I, I, yeah, where you think, oh gosh, that didn't go well. And people, you never know. It's, it's amazing. Let's see here. Where else do we want to go with this? What is one thing you wish you could tell your younger self? Oh, my younger self. My younger self was really creative and imaginative, very adorably chubby, wore glasses when nobody else was wearing glasses. Uh, we were, you know, grew up in poverty and somehow, you know, kept journaling and writing and imagining worlds that didn't exist. And so I guess I would tell little Tanya to, to hang in there and uh, to keep writing and observing everything around you because someday all of your observations and writing and performing and your desire to connect with people will impact many people and impact you in a positive way. Mm, I love that. And it brings me to, I guess, one final question for you. I definitely see you as a voice of authority when it comes to creativity. And that's a pretty big statement when you think, I believe everybody is creative. And then you have people who are just more self-actualized than others. Well, you're pretty high up there. And what can you tell me about creativity in terms of times when maybe you didn't feel as creative? What did you do? What, how do you spark that back? Yeah, for me, uh, I always go to, you know, I'm a, a big reader and I kind of, I practice Buddhism and, and uh, so I go to my, my teachers. Pema Chodron is definitely one of my teachers, uh, a person I learned from in, in writing and um, in different forms. And there's something she says, I'm not going to, uh, I'm just going to kind of uh, work around the quote, I don't remember. But basically, when you're in distress, when you're experiencing a lot of fear and anxiety, that even though it's counterintuitive to go into the fear, she says, you know, that our job is to move into the fear and discomfort as opposed to run away from it. So as a creative person myself and as somebody who sort of teaches creativity, I always tell people to move into the, the fear and discomfort. So one example is when I was actually 
invited to work at a contemporary art museum. And uh, my job was, uh, they invited me to work there because they had a new space that they wanted to create. They wanted somebody to create new programs, new revenue streams, a uh, new brand, like new everything. And they thought, well, you know what? We want somebody who's disruptive to, to come in and um, break the rules of the museum and, you know, uh, do some exciting things. And my first day on the job, after being introduced to everybody, my boss was like, and here's your office, you you disruptive thinker out of the box kind of person. And it was a cubicle. Mm -hmm. And I thought this is either ironic or like just scary and ho holy shit, what am I doing? Why did I take this job? You know, they hired me to think outside of the box and then quickly stuck me in a box. And so I had ch some choices. My choice was to leave the job, you know, while I was still young. Um, or, you know, I started asking myself these questions. And this is a good question for anybody who's listening who wants to practice being creative. It's asking what if questions. So these are questions that they automatically assume that there's possibility beyond this moment, beyond this space and time. And so I started asking myself, well, what if instead of the cubicle being the worst part of the museum, what if it was the best part of the museum? And what if I could make programs that actually sprung from being stuck in this space to show other people how to get unstuck? And what if, and so I launched, the first program I launched was an online series called out of the cubicle where I, I hired a videographer and we snuck out of my cubicle and we made these videos that poked fun at and also celebrated the very art institution I worked for. And people started watching all around the country and then in other countries, etc. And the, you know, long story short, it was an opportunity for me to embrace something that I thought was a major challenge. And it was also an opportunity for me to show people outside of museum culture that museums can be just as weird and mundane and exciting and horrifying as any other workspace. And it worked. Mm, total renegade move. I love it. What if? It really is a question that leads to innovation. It, it has to almost, right? It's like a, a ticket, a ticket to innovation. I love that. That's so good. And actually, before we wrap up, I would love for you to share a little bit about It Was Never a Dress because, oh, that campaign, when you... And the concept, when you came up with it, and I was first exposed to it just through the, I don't know, social media tunnels or something, I just thought it was so brilliant and captured what I had felt for so long. And I, I know other people felt the same because it did go viral. And I know that word gets thrown around, but it truly did do its thing um, in terms of reaching so many people so quickly. Will you give us just a tiny bit of backstory and then also explain the concept a little bit? Because it just, yeah, I, I can't speak highly enough. Yeah. And you know what, Amy Jo, the cool thing actually about uh, writing my new book is that I got, I got to write the story behind it so that people could understand that this thing that seemed like, like super viral and everybody in the world knew about it, that it wasn't like a, a magic trick or didn't require any special human being or human beings um, thinking or doing some, I mean, that, that anybody can kind of come up with an idea that has some uh, staying power and that people embrace and champion. So Anyway, I just was excited to explore it. So basically, when I worked at a company called AxoSoft, and I have to say that It Was Never a Dress is like a true collaboration, which is means this, that here's a tech company hired me, Tanya Katan, who worked at a museum, has a degree in theater, and had written a memoir to be, work in software mm -hmm. for software developers and be a brand evangelist. So that was the first part of the collaboration. They invited an outsider inside to do something that they were excited about and didn't know anything about. We did, we explored what this role of evangelist meant together. And so um, about three months into my, my job at Axosoft, the uh, CEO, uh, Laudan, had asked a colleague, Sarah and myself, to come up with an idea to address the women in uh, tech issue. And uh, this is 2015. So the issue at the time, and still is arguably, is that women uh, weren't being invited into the tech space um, or acknowledged or, you know, it was, it was a rough time uh, for women in tech and people were starting to talk about it more formally and in uh, social media and all of that. 
and we were going to host a, a, a big conference called Girls in Technology. And, you know, my boss wanted us to come up with an idea, a big idea. And so Sarah and I brainstormed and came up with nothing. So, mm-hmm. so uh, you know, I, I, I started thinking about, you know, what it meant to be a woman in the tech space or really like in theater or any, any space. And there are so many times that women aren't seen or celebrated or even listened to uh, or regarded as the superheroes that we are in everyday life. And uh, so I, I thought about symbols that represented uh, women and, you know, kind of had my little notepad with me, was making notes. And then I thought about the bathroom uh, women's symbol. And so th- those of you who are listening, you know, she's got a triangle dress. She's got a round head and some arms and legs. And I br- I'm like, well, maybe there's something with the women's bathroom symbol. And I brought her back to my colleague, Sarah. And I said, here, I've got a symbol. I don't have an idea yet, but I have a symbol. And she's like, great. And we kind of sat on it and there was really nothing to discuss. But it was really the shape of her dress that, I couldn't stop thinking about. So yeah, you know, a triangle is a dress and it's lots of other things too, right? And thought, well, you know what? I I I think she's wearing a cape. And I felt like a crazy person, Amy Joe. Like for real. Like I was just like, am I crazy? Am I the old person at the young tech company who's like, hey kids, <laughs> get around. Mama's got an idea, you know? And they're like, oh, that's a great idea. Leave us alone. But um I couldn't <laughs> shake it. So I, uh, you know, I'm very visual. I I printed out the women's bathroom vector and I took a pencil and I made a few literally like one, two, three, like four lines, and I realized she was wearing a cape. And at that point I'm like, ooh. Ooh, we are on to something. And I brought the, this new image back to Sarah and I'm like, juice behold, you know, and Sarah's like, ah, it was never a dress. And I'm like, ah, that's it. And so we took this idea and by, you know, it was a loose idea, you know, it was basically, but I, I felt like this, you know, I'm a pretty, I'm a very observant person and a pretty smart person. And if I, if my perception was shifted about this thing I've seen every day since I was like four years old and had to pee pee in a public restroom, then maybe, maybe other people would see it too. And then, you know, we, uh, this is where I get to write more uh, meatily about it in the book, but we got pushback, you know, in house. And this is something, you know, we don't really talk about, but internally my boss was like, this is a great idea. And then some people were like, this is the worst idea ever. And some were like, this is a great idea. And then others were like, you know, why should we invest any resources, including our time into making something that isn't going to sell more software. And ultimately, you know, uh, the boss was like, let's do this. And I have to really say that was a, a, a really big risk for her to take. And um, so we got to work we made basically we we worked with our a graphic designer and um i just hovered over him as i said make less this more that and he made this image of the bathroom na- lady juxtaposed with the new uh really newly imagined you know badass cape wearing lady and then we launched it at a girls in tech conference i gave a talk about gender equity we handed out these stickers the it was never dress and somebody posted it and wrote cannot unsee and it literally it went viral like in 24 hours there were over 20 million organic impressions and viral you know viral is one thing as you know you know we were just talking about social media not not necessarily being a hotbed of authenticity but, and you really know things that are have resonance and are authentic because the ripple effects are felt long after that moment and in fact literally yesterday i was somewhere and somebody i was like oh my god uh, i was at like a hotel in Palm Springs. They're like, were, were, were you the one who um, helped create that? It was never a dress. I, you know, I've been loving it for years. I haven't, you know, and she showed me the sticker and la la la. And the point being is the best part about that campaign and how I know personally, how I, I, I know personally that it worked and that I feel really good about it being in the world is that people have made it their own. It's not about Axosoft or mm-hmm. me anything. Mm-hmm. It's it's about people feeling like, oh my gosh, I, I can find my value. I can find my inner cape too. You know, it's it's not it's not about anybody who created it. It's about everybody who embraces it, really. So mm-hmm. I couldn't agree more. I think it totally transcends a company and a, a marketing or positioning, you know, um, stance. It's it's much bigger, and I'm glad it does because what you created, although it, it resonates with so many people, it does have a personal meaning in the same swim swim lane, you know, as 
each other, but it, it just, and especially kids. And I just think about, you know, these young girls growing up and wanting to wear a cape or, or imagining their inside cape, as you say. Just, it, it's so powerful, so brilliant. And thank you for sharing that because it's, I think it was my first introduction into you, but then it came full circle and we started doing a little bit more in working with young girls in the Girls for Progress conference. So anyway, so thank you. And thank you for your time today and your energy. I am excited to just watch you fly. And thank goodness you were pushed out of that nest. (laughs) Oh, Amy Jo, thank you so much. You know, I adore you and I admire you and I appreciate you doing what you're doing to expose lots of people to lots of different ways of being in the world. So thank you. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the show. Hit me up on social media to let me know what you think. I'm at Amy Jo Martin on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I want to hear your why not now moments so I can share them on the show. Just send me a note to why not now at amyjomartin.com. For show notes and other offers, you can visit amyjomartin.com forward slash why not now. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email newsletter for exclusive content and announcements. A big thanks to Rock Salt Music for all of the tunes by the talented John Coggins. And of course, a hat tip to Richard Gruer for editing and producing the show. I'll see you next time. And until then, why not now? Thank you.